can I find a stock that is better than Warren Buffett's? Let's dive straight into it. Hi everyone, this is Pete here. So today we're going to talk about the Chinese New Year pick that I have, all right, in terms of stocks, huh? for 2024 okay so for chinese new year usually what do we want we want something that's always very red and good right and one company immediately comes to mind because when i was young i would always watch the television and there were a lot of advertisement about this particular beverage okay and this is also a company that warren buffett has heavily invested in in the past and that is none other than coca-cola all right so you know Coca-Cola, the very iconic red drink, and he has been one of the best investment for Warren Buffett, right, since he invested. In fact, to today, I think he's still receiving millions of dollars in dividend uh, from Coca-Cola. But the question is, can I find something better than that, okay? And I think today, I have the exact stock for you. Now, what is this company, all right? And it is actually none other than it. <laughs> is this a mistake? No, uh, okay, if you look at it carefully, uh, this is actually not Coca-Cola company, but another business that is known as the Coca-Cola Consolidated, okay, right? So what is this Coca-Cola Consolidated? What do they actually do? Okay, now to distinguish the two, uh, you need to understand how the Coca-Cola company works, right? So the Coca-Cola company itself is the producer behind the iconic soda brand called Coca-Cola, okay? Uh, they own the rights to the Coca-Cola syrup, which is still a very secret formula that nobody knows, okay? So it is actually the holder and owner of all this intellectual property, including the formula and including the brand. Bear in mind, Coca-Cola is sold globally, worldwide, and it's not possible for a single company, right, to do this all by themselves. So this is exactly what Coca-Cola does, right? So they own all the rights, but they actually outsource a lot of the production and distribution uh, globally, right? And they sell all these uh, syrups to what we call independent bottling partners, right? So you can see over here, the main company is focus on creating the syrups and the concentrate. Sometimes they do have finished products where they pass it to bottlers uh, to distribute. But most of the time, they actually do not create the finished product. They actually give the whole formula to these companies and these companies swear by themselves. Uh, they will not reveal this to other people, but they will produce the drink and help to distribute. Okay, so there are over 200 bottling partners right now, right, generating all these products. Uh. By the way, Coca-Cola company, does not only sell Coca-Cola. They sell many other products that you can see over here as well. So over 950 facilities are producing all these so-called Coca-Cola products. And if you look at the Coca-Cola business globally, right, North America, while it is not the largest in terms of volume, that means how many bottles being sold, but in terms of revenue, it is the largest. It is at 35%, right? And if you look over here in terms of operating income, it is actually about the same uh, as three other continents put together. Okay, so you see Europe, Middle East, and Africa come together is only 29%. Whereas North America, which is USA itself, already accounts for 28% of the operating businesses. Now, why am I looking at bottlers in this case, right? Because there has always been a push within the Coca-Cola company to actually outsource more. Okay, so you can see over here, they actually highlighted this uh, in their 2022 annual report that the contribution, okay, from all this bottling investment uh, in terms of per revenue uh, is actually going down. So what they are saying is that they actually don't want to own the bottlers because they feel that actually owning the bottler is not good, right? And the Coca-Cola company even outrightly stated that by reducing all this bottling investment, uh, that means owning the factory, owning the production facility, right, to put the liquid into the bottle, uh, by removing all this, they are saying that they will actually improve their return on investment capital over here, ROIC, okay? And you can see this one is from their slides. Globally, right, they have been doing this thing called the refranchising of businesses. Now, what is refranchising? Basically, it is the opposite of franchising. How it is done is that they will set up the facility, they will develop the business, and what they do after that is that they actually sell away all this business uh, to a third party to run it for them. 
right? So that on the books of the Coca-Cola company, the broader company, they don't have to worry and fuss about all these things, okay? So you can see over here, Canada is already done, US is already done, all right? Uh, some of the South America country is already done. Mainly the areas that they still own is actually in uh, Africa and also Asia, right? Interestingly, uh, China is also done already. So they recently also just finished for Cambodia and they also sold Australia, right, to their partners in Europe as well. So this is something that they have been pushing and they want to get it done. And I think as much as possible, they don't want to own any bottling facilities. They want to be very asset-like, okay? But later on, we'll see, is that a good decision, huh? all right? So over here, I'm going to focus on the key bottlers in the US, right? So there are many key bottlers here. And the one that I want to focus on is this company called Coca-Cola Consolidated, right? Now, this company was first started uh, uh, in 1902, right? And they first started selling this drink basically as a bottler, right? They started selling this uh, in North Carolina. And over the years, right, this business has flourished into the largest, right, independent bottler in the USA. In fact, among all the bottlers, this is the only one that Coca-Cola actually owns and it is listed in the NASDAQ. So if you look over here, in terms of ownership, you can see a very interesting thing. Coca-Cola company over here, they own close to 30% of the businesses. But at the top line, you can see there's this guy called J. Frank Harrison III, okay? And he owns 10% of the common stocks and for the class B stocks, that means these are the stocks that give you extraordinary voting power, he owns almost 100% of it. And that gives this gentleman over here, J. Frank Harrison, right, over 70% of the votes. That means uh, he is the boss. Whatever he says goes. And like I said, this is in fact the only bottler in the US that is partially owned by Coca-Cola, right, which is the first one, Coca-Cola Bottling Consolidated. There are a few more. One of them is owned by actually the Japanese beverage company called Kirin. And the rest are actually independent. So if you want to invest in one of their key bottlers, this is the only one. So exactly how big is Coca-Cola Consolidated, right? Over here, we can see they have over 10 bottling plants, 60 distribution centers, and they actually only serve 14 states because there are about 10 to 12 bottlers in the whole USA. But just by having this number of plants and centers, right, they are serving over 366 million cases, not bottles, uh, cases of drinks, uh, right, just in 2022 itself. So let's quickly compare the two of them, right? So you can see over here, I've already segregated Coca-Cola company, which is the ticker symbol is KO, and Coca-Cola consolidated, the ticker symbol is actually C-O-K-E, Coke, okay? Now, what's the main difference? Once again, KO owns the rights to the syrup, whereas K uh, Coke, right, distributes them to the 14 states. So the main thing I want to highlight here is that the P-E ratio is quite interesting, right? Coca-Cola is at a much expensive 23 times earnings, uh, whereas uh, COKE, the bottler, is only at 17x, right? Price to operating cash flow for Coca-Cola itself is 21 times, whereas for the bottler, it's only 10 times, okay? So on the front end, we already see that, hey, uh, Coca-Cola company itself, uh, the broader company that owns the rights, right, is actually more expensive than the bottler, right? And in fact, if you look at the other indicators, for example, a gross margin, net margin, and even ROE, right? You can see that uh, they actually beat the bottler, right? Coca-Cola company itself, right, has 59% gross margin compared to the gross margin of uh, the bottler at 38%. Net margin-wise, it is about 24% compared to only the 6.8% of the bottler, right? And even in terms of efficiency, if we look at ROE, Coca-Cola company does 42%, whereas the bottler does 34%. And last but not least, for a lot of the people who like to buy dividend stocks, which I cannot understand for the heck of life why, but if you like dividend stocks, right, Coca-Cola gives you 3.1%, whereas the bottler only gives you a miserable 0.17%. So on the surface, it does look like Coca-Cola company is a much better company. So Pete, what are you talking about? Why are you sharing about this bottler company? It doesn't look like a good investment. But if we were to reverse time and go back into 2017 until today, let's look at the share price performance and how would they have performed, right? Now, over here, maybe pause the video if you are watching it 
ask yourself, which do you think is a better share price performance? So, have you guessed it? It is actually the bottler. Now, how big is the difference? Over here, you can see this is a very big chart. Uh, Coca-Cola itself, right, the company, over the last six years since 2017, right, has done 82%, right? It actually underperforms uh, the S&P 500 that actually does 128%. However, the bottler has done tremendously well, right? Over 535%. And one thing I want to highlight to you guys is this. This is even after I have adjusted for the dividend already, right? So if I take away the dividend from the Coca-Cola uh, share price, it will be lower than 82%. So you can see there's a very big difference in terms of share price over here. Now the question is, why? Why is that the case? Okay, so let's take a look at the share price itself, right? Right now per share for Coke company uh, is about $60. For the bottler, right, it's about $847. Now let's take a look at some of the reasons why despite Coca-Cola being seemingly a much better business in terms of margin, efficiency, and even on the dividend front, right, Coca-Cola bottler actually outperformed them in share price, right? So if we look at one of the key components of assessing a company, right, in my view, is actually cash flow, right? How much money you actually bring into the business. You can see the comparison here for the bottler, Coke bottler, right? Their operating cash flow has always been very strong, very positive. In fact, it has been ever increasing. Since 2015, right, till today, the operating cash flow has increased by eight times, 800%, okay? Whereas if we look at Coca-Cola company, Although their operating cash flow is much bigger, but it's not a number that has increased a lot, right, since 2015. In fact, during the 2019-2018 period, it even fell, right? So this is also one of the key reasons. If your cash flow is not growing, then it's very hard for the share price to grow. Now, another thing I want to add is that because of the cash flow, when you look at the book value of the business, right, for those of you who don't know, book value is basically the asset of the company minus away all the liability, right? How much is it worth right, intrinsically uh, and divide by all the shares? So this is actually the one of the most conservative way of valuing a company because it is really looking at assets. It's not even looking at the brand or anything else, uh, right? And you can see because of the cash flow, right? The book value of the bottler has been increasing very, very fast, okay? Right, it was only $26 per share right back in 2015 and right now it is $162 right that is an eight times increase whereas for coke company itself you can see the book value has really not risen at all now just now we talk about roe yes indeed coke company has a much better roe at 42 percent versus the bottler at 34 percent but one thing to take note is that roe is an indicator that can be really uh, tear apart or even destroy uh, by the use of debt okay so over here, you can see that when we take away the debt and we just look at the invested capital, right? All right? Coca-Cola company itself, the ROIC, the return on invested capital, actually dropped to 13%. Whereas the bottler actually maintains their ROIC at 23%. So this is almost a, a company that is 80% more efficient, right? In bringing return based on how much they invest into it and not just based on using debt. Another thing you can see over here is that for the Coke company itself, the revenue has kind of been flat, right, throughout, in fact, going down for a period of time. Whereas the bottle itself, while the total global volume of Coca-Cola products being sold has dropped, right, their revenue has always been increasing. So this gives me a very interesting finding is that I believe these bottlers are able to pass down the increasing cost to the Coke company right, quite effectively, so that even when the volume drops, they are still able to increase their price and maintain and even increase their revenue. Now, finally, I think this is perhaps the main reason uh, why Coke, the bottler, right, did better than Coke, the company itself. Right? It's because of this one thing, which is what we call cost of goods, okay? In this case, over here, it is uh, put as cost of revenue. They are the same thing. Now, what is this cost of goods and cost of revenue? It is basically the money that you need to pay in order to produce 
the goods that you're selling. So in this case, we're talking about, for example, how much are the syrup, right? How much are the bottles or the cans, right? And how much does it cost to put all these together and make that product itself? Now, one thing you will see is that for Coke company, their cost of revenue uh, has actually been increasing at a much slower rate, okay? Much slower rate than uh, the Coke company. In fact, if you look at the gross margin, as the revenue increase, right? This is the bottler. As the revenue increase, the gross margin actually increases as well. And it's not just that the gross margin has been increasing in the last couple of years, but you can see over here, while the gross margin did increase, but not to a very much extent, right? When we look at the operating margin, this is where the impact really comes through, right? You can see that the operating margin since 2018 has come up from 1% all the way up to 10%. That's a 10 times increase in efficiency. So what's happening here is that it is very clear that the bottlers actually have what we call a fixed cost model. That means they will have to pay a certain amount to run the plant, run the bottling uh, business, run the processes, creating the drinks or the syrup. But beyond a certain level, what happens is that any more requirements will actually not incur more costs, right? So what we can see here is that it is very likely the operating margin starts to improve beyond the 4% mark. And that greatly improves their efficiency because regardless whether they are producing, let's say, uh, 10,000 units in the past or even 20,000 units going in the future, the cost is roughly the same. Therefore, they are able to reap a much higher operating margin. Another telltale sign that tells us that it's a very fixed core model is that when you compare the 2020 revenue, 2021 and 2022 together versus the net income across the three years, you can see that the sales uh, didn't increase much, right? It was about uh, 5 billion, 5.5 billion, 6.2 billion. So the increase is maybe about like a 20%. But you can see that from 2020, the net income was 172 million, right? Then it went up to 189 million. So this is still linear. But once it goes into 2022, where the net sales went up to 6.2 billion, you will expect this to increase maybe to about 200 plus million. But what we see here is a 400 plus million in terms of profit. So this tells you that past a certain level, right? The profit just rakes in already because the cost doesn't increase uh, any further. Okay. Now, of course, you can uh, justify by saying there are certain differences in the other expenses. But from what I can see is that the impact of this is not very high. Even if I take into account all these, the difference between net income from 2021 to 2022 will still be over two times, 200% uh, increase. Another thing that got me quite excited about this company, right, is that I always like to look at the management. And the management is actually none other than J. Frank Harrison. Now, if you find this name familiar, it's because at the earlier sites, right, we actually have seen this name Harrison before. Where is this name coming from? It's actually the founder of the business, okay? So you can see over here, right? So this was actually the founding of the business where the Harrison family started the business. And this is actually right now, the J. Frank Harrison is actually the great grandson of the original founder. And they actually own over 70%. So I really like this kind of family business uh, where they have the speaking rights and they are able to consolidate all the power to make sure that they are doing the correct thing. In addition to the fact that this is a family run business and the family still are the majority shareholder and voting rights, okay, we want to look at what are the incentives right, that drives the management because Charlie Munger always say this, right, show me the incentive and I will show you the behavior. So let's look at incentive. Now, in many companies, they always pack the incentive uh, in terms of like, oh, you know, is, is it uh, to the share price, right? If the share price goes up, okay, that's where we would love, right, the management a lot and give them a lot of money, give them a lot of uh, bonuses. But you can see over here, the incentive structure of this company is very much aligned to only one thing, the profitability of the business. Okay, so you can see over here, there's three main performance measure, which is earnings, right? Free cash flow and also revenue. And you can see that in terms of weightage, uh, earnings and cash flow weighs 40 and 40. So there's 80% in total. Whereas sales is only 20%. Now, why is this important? Because if you weigh the sales too much, you can have a business that generates a lot, a lot of revenue, uh, 
but very little profit because maybe they have a lot of expenses. So it doesn't incentivize the management to actually think for the business and optimize the cost, okay? Trust me, I know a lot of businesses out there that are like that. The revenue is very, very high, but the profit margin is so minuscule, right? That it's not worth investing in, okay? Now, in addition to that, you can see over here in terms of the payment and the salary, right? For the CEO, right, the uh, JF Harrison, right, the third, uh, his salary is actually uh, not a lot, uh, right? It's only about 1.2 million, okay? Uh, where does most of his bonuses come in is actually in the matter of uh, shares, right? So I love this, right? So in total, it looks like he's earning a lot, $40 million, but in essence, he is being compensated mostly via shares. So that means if the company does well, he does well too, right? He is not just a paid salaried worker over here. All right, so all in all, I think this is a fantastic business. And on top of that, uh, being a more efficient business as well, a better cash flow and very aligned incentive structure, right? Unlike the Coke company itself, I can tell you right now, it's definitely not a family run business and it's so big, such a big conglomerate. And that's why they are paying out a lot of dividend because they don't really know what to do with the money. So they have to return to shareholders. In fact, I will tell you, if Coca-Cola company decide not to pay dividend and say that I want to reinvest this money, guess what is going to happen to their share price? The share price is going to tank, right? And they're not going to do that. Whereas for this bottler, because it's a family-run, family-owned, insider-owned majority business, right? They are able to do what is correct for the business. Not paying out a lot of dividend, but they reinvest the business, uh, the money into the business and make it a better business overall, okay? So overall, I really like Coke Bottler as a business. This is a company that I'm having a very close watch. When there's an opportunity, I might think about entering. Now, the question is this. What is a good price to enter? So over here, I did a very quick uh, DCF, discounted cash flow uh, valuation. And what I got is that the fair value is around $844. Now, as of this recording, the share price is actually $847. So it's very close. So I would say right now it's about fair value. Now, for those of you who are running DCF, just to let you know what I'm running here, I'm assuming a growth rate of 8% only, which is not too ridiculous and terminal growth i'm only assuming at about 2.5 percent okay discounted rate is about eight percent as well so you can see that i'm using very conservative numbers and right now uh cook bottler uh, is still at fair value that means any of these expectations were to be slightly better in the future then we will expect a much better return all right, so that's all I have. I hope you all like my Chinese New Year pick for 2024, all right? My top stock for CNY 2024. Let me know what do you think. Do you love this stock? Do you think this is a better investment than Warren Buffett's Coca-Cola? Or maybe he should sell those and buy this, right? Uh, let me know your comments over here. Once again, if you like the content over here, do like and subscribe. And to everyone out there who celebrates Chinese New Year, 恭喜发财, 新年快乐. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.